And in my last lesson, I told you that I was going to present you the various kind of chemical compound. And that before doing this, I showed you what oxidation number was, because in chemistry, in the definition of the various compound, or in the definition of the various chemical compound, the oxidation number is very a very important parameter. Then the oxidation number it will be very important also when we will be talking about various kind of reaction. But now today it is possible to begin to show you the various kind of chemical compound. Let's begin with the binary compound in which it is present hydrogen. Well, the a chemical compound are uh, uh, presented by a chemical formula. And when the chemical compound, there are only two elements, namely it is a binary compound, we have that the more electronegative element is written on the right, whereas the less electronegative element is written on the left. So, we have two kinds of compound in which hydrogen is present. When uh, hydrogen is bound to a non-metal, the hydrogen is the less electronative element, whereas the non-metal is the more electronative compound. Uh, as an example, HCl, HI, H2S. Well, in the previous lesson, we saw how the combination ratio of the various elements is decided by the number of electrons that the two elements that are involved in the formation of the compound present in their, uh, in their outer shell. So the combination is 1-1 one, one in uh, HCl, 1-1 one, one in the compound HI, 2-1 in the compound HS. Then giving a name to this compound is very, very easy. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, you use the prefix hydro and the, the suffix ic, and you had the work acid because all these compounds exhibit acidic properties. So HCl is named hydrochloric acid. HI is called hydroiodidic acid, and so on. Then there are another kind of compound that, there are another kind of compound that, uh, in which there are hydrogen and there are, and there are metals. In this case, the metal is the less electronegative compound and the hydrogen is the more electronegative element. Well, in this uh, compound, hydrogen is present is H minus one ion, namely uh, the hydrogen atom has only one electron in its outer shell. It takes another electron which is supplied by the atom of metals and so hydrogen full as is outer shell completely filled such as helium. So the ion H minus one it's a very, very stable structure. And uh, uh, this is an ionic compound, namely this is an ionic solid in which the uh, positive ion and the negative uh, H minus one ion are all together thus forming the solid ionic, uh, the solid, uh, the solid ionic. Well, uh, the ion H minus one is called the hydride ion. So all these compounds are, as an example, LeH, lithium hydride, calcium H2, calcium hydride, and so on. Then we have the binary compound which contains oxygen. These compounds are said oxides. As an example, CaO, calcium oxide, um, Na2O, sodium oxide, and so on. It may occur, and it occurs quite often, that when oxygen is bound to a non-metal compound, you have more than one oxide. As an example, you have SO2, 
and SO3. To uh, distinguish these two compounds with a different name, the first one, SO2, is called sulfur dioxide. The second one is called sulfur trioxide, uh, in indicating, thus indicating, the number of oxygen atoms that are bound to the non-metal atom. In the case of the sulfur dioxide, two, so sulfur dioxide. In the case of the sulfur trioxide, are three atoms of oxygen. You can also call this compound uh, sulfur four oxide, sulfur six oxide, uh, referring to the oxidation number which sulfur exhibits in this compound. Well, to, may, to bring another example, wait for a moment. We have, as we already saw in our first lesson, that nitrogen makes four different oxides namely the N2O, NO, N2O3, NO2, N2O5. These compounds are named as follow. N2O is called dinitrogen oxide, namely the fact that two atoms of nitrogen are bound to one atom of oxygen is denoted by the fact that nitrogen is preceded by the prefix D, nitrogen oxide, then in D nitrogen trioxide there are bound all together two atoms of nitrogen and three atoms of oxygen. In nitrogen dioxide you have two atoms of oxygen that are bound to one atom of nitrogen and in N2O5 you have five atoms of oxygen that are bound to two atoms of nitrogen. Then another example, you have two oxides that the oxygen forms together with carbon and are CO, which is the carbon monoxide, and CO2, which is the carbon dioxide. Then you have the binary compound without, a, without hydrogen and without oxygen. These compounds are called salt. And uh, also in this case you have that the more electronegative element is written on the right and the, 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 the less negative, then the less electronegative element on the, um, sorry, the more electronegative element is written on the right and the other on the left. If the reference difference of electronegativity is large, it results in the formation of an ionic bond. Whereas if the difference of electronegativity is small, it results in the formation of a polar covalent bond. Well, uh, to give a name, you add the suffix "-ide", to the name of the non-metal element. So NaCl is sodium chloride, which is ionic. So MgF2 is magnesium fluoride, also ionic. As an example, PF3 is phosphor trifluoride, which is polar covalent. And also PF5 is phosphorus pentafluoride, which is polar covalent. Well, uh, if some difficulty may arise in the calculation of the oxidation number of this compound, you must think that this compound may be derived by the formal substitution in the corresponding acid of the hydrogen atom with the metal atom. As an example, in sodium chloride, if you do not know how to attribute the exad oxidation number, you must remember that the sodium chloride derives from hydrofluoric acid. In hydrofluoric acid, uh, hydrogen exhibit oxidation number plus one, chlorine exhibit oxidation number minus one, so chlorine keeps its 
minus one oxidation number, also in sodium chlorides. And this is the reason why sodium exhibit oxidation number plus two. Plus one, excuse me. Then we have the ternary compound <coughs> where there is present oxygen and hydrogen. First of all, we have hydroxide, which are oxide are ionic compound, where there is the hydroxyl ion OH minus one, and it is present together with the metal ion. Let's see the, uh, the electronic structure of the uh, hydroxyl ion. Oxygen has Z equal eight, so its electronic structure is 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4. And the electron symbol of the electronic symbol of oxygen is this one. The two electrons located in 2s are this one. The two electrons located in 2px are this one. The electron located in 2py is this one. The electron located in 2pz is this one. Then this is the electron structure of hydrogen, Z equal one, one as one, only one electron. This atom of hydrogen with this red electron is put here. This is the electronic structure of hydroxyl ion. Look at the green electron reported here. The green electron reported here is the electron given by the metal ion, which has lost its electron, and this electron now is located here. And this is just the electron which gives the minus one charge to this ion. Then the minus one charge of this ion is balanced by the positive charge of the metal ion. So we have lithium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, um, sodium hydroxide, aluminium hydroxide, and so on. Obviously, the ratio combination between the hydroxyl ion OH-1 and the metal ion is given by the charge of the metal ion. As an example, sodium exhibit plus one charge, uh, calcium exhibit plus two charge, aluminum exhibit plus three charge, and the ratio of combination is one to one, one to two, one to three. Then we, other, uh, we have another kind of compound in which there are present hydrogen, oxygen, and unknown metal. These are called oxygenated, oxygenated acid. In this compound, you have that the, the um, non-metal atom is bound to the various oxygen atom. And to, to their turn, some of these oxygen atoms are bound to the hydrogen atom. Well, it is very usual to have for this uh, high oxygenated atom to have more than one oxygen atom, atom per every non-metal. As an example, for sulfur we have H2SO3 and H2SO4. Well, to distinguish these two different compounds, we give to the uh, acid which exhibit the lower amount of oxygen, the suffix os, whereas we give the suffix ic to the oxygenated acid which exhibit the highest oxygen compound. So we have the sulfurous acid and the sulfuric acid. But the situation may be also more complicated. Like as an example, chlorine forms four different oxygenated atoms, HClO, HCl2, HClO3, HClO4. Well, to give a different name to these four different compounds, you take the two oxygenated atoms that are in the middle, in this case HClO2, HClO3. 
to this compound you give to the one that exhibits the lower oxygen amount, the, the, the suffix os, and the, uh, to the one that exhibits the higher oxygen amount, you give the, the, the suffix ic. So HClO2 is the chlorous acid. HClO3 is the chloric acid. And uh, the atom which have the lowest HClO and the highest HClO4 content of oxygen, you add the prefix hypo and the suffix os, and you call hypochlorous acid to the one which exhibits the lowest oxygen content, and for the one who exhibits the, the highest oxygen content, you use the prefix hyper and the suffix ic, and so HClO4 is the hyperchloric acid, okay? Then we have the ternary salts. Ternary salts may be considered as formally derived from oxygenated acid upon the substitution of H atom which, with metal atom. So we had the sulfurous acid H2SO3 and we had the sulfuric acid H2SO4. Upon the substitution of the H atom with the sodium atom, we have N2SO3 and N2SO4. And to give a different name to this compound, we use the suffix "-ite", to the compound which exhibit the lower oxygen content, namely Na2SO3 is the sodium sulfite, whereas we give the suffix eight, eight to the compound which exhibit the higher oxygen compound. So this is N2SO4, which is the sodium sulfate. In the case of the NaClO, NaClO2, NaClO3, NaClO4, they are derived from the corresponding oxygenaton acid upon the substitution of the hydrogen atom with the sodium atom. So we have uh, the, to give a name that the two in the middle, we give the suffix "-ite", to the one which exhibits the lower oxygen content, and the suffix "-eight", to the one which exhibit the higher oxygen content. So NaClO2 is sodium chloride, NaClO3 is sodium chlorate. And to give a name to the extreme compound, NaClO and NaClO4, we consider that we use the suffix "-ite", and the prefix hypo. So NaClO is sodium hypochlorite, and NaClO4 is the sodium hyperchlorite because we use the suffix eight and the, and the prefix hyper. Well, if there is any difficulty in giving the right oxidation number to this compound, we, are, we can also imagine that these compounds are derived from the corresponding oxygenated atom by the formal substitution, upon the formal substitution of the hydrogen atom with metal atom. As an example, hypochloric acid, we have that hydrogen exhibit the plus one oxidation number oxygen exhibit minus two oxidation number. So making this simple calculation, we have that the oxidation number of chlorine is plus two. So in the salts that may be considered as formally derived from 
hypochloric acid upon the formal substitution of hydrogen atom with, as an example, calcium atom, we have that the formula is CaClO2 taken two times. So the oxidation number of, of calcium is X. We have that chlorine keeps the oxidation number plus one, which had in hypochloric acid, and oxygen as minus two. By solving this simple first order equation, we have the result that the oxidation number is plus two. Finally, there are the acid salts. The acid salts are those salts in which we have that not all the hydrogen atom were uh, substituted with metal atom. As an example, if we have sulfurous acid, sulfurous acid is H2SO3. If we substituted both hydrogen atom with two sodium atom, we have sodium sulfide. But if we substitute only one hydrogen atom, we have this salt, NaHSO4, which has sodium hydrogen sulfate. To denote that it is an acid salt, you add the, the prefix hydrogen to the name of the compound. So NH. SO4 is sodium hydrogen sulfate. As an example, Na2HPO4 is this sodium hydrogen phosphate. Hydrogen phosphate, this is a mistake. And then NaH2PO3 is sodium dihydrogen phosphate. Finally, There are compounds like this. These are called hydrated salt. And an example, you may quite often encounter it. Compound like this, NaCl per 5 H2O. This compound is called an hydrated salt, just to mean that in the structure of sodium chlorate, in the empty space left inside the structure of the sodium chlorate, find location at particular number of water molecules. These molecules are located therein because of the formation of dative bond. And this dative bond arises from the fact that the oxygen of water put its unpaired electron doublet into the empty orbital of sodium and chloride atom. You know, this water is not bound very strongly to sodium chlorate. Actually, if you warm up hydrated sodium chloride up to the temperature of 100 to 120 degrees, it turns into an hydrated sodium chloride and water, okay? But if you bring back sodium chlorate to room temperature, it assumes again the five molecules of the water from the humid air. Okay? Well, as far as as far as um, as far as uh, compound, chemical compound, I presented all the chemical compounds. Now it is the moment to present the chemical reaction. Well, what does occur in a chemical reaction? In a chemical reaction, some chemical compound called reactant transform into older compound, which are called products of the reaction. It occurs as some bond existing between the atoms of reactant is broken. And then these atoms form other bonds with different atoms of other reactants 
leading to the formation of products of the action that are different from the reactants, okay? There are two kinds of reasons that uh, may, uh, may give rise to a chemical reaction. One of these reasons is this one, is that we go from reactant to product of reaction because the energy of the system decreases. Namely, I showed you in the last lesson that everything in nature tends to the lowest possible energy. For example, this piece of plastic, if I leave them to fall down, it falls down over the desktop because over the desktop exhibit a potential energy which is lower than when I have in my hand here. Okay? And this is the same thing that occurs in chemical reaction. We pass, we go from a energy level of the reactant H1, which is higher, to the energy level of the product of reaction H2, which is lower. So, this criterion through which uh, this system goes spontaneously ahead if we want to write it with a, chemi with a formula, we have to write that the delta H of R in reaction, which is equal to the enthalpy of the final state H2 minus the enthalpy of the initial state H1, this difference must be lower than zero. Namely, the energy of the system in a chemical reaction must decrease. But we have also some reaction in which, which occurs with a, an increase of energy of the system. What does occur in this kind of reaction? In this kind of reaction occurs something like this. We go, we, we go from reactants to products of reaction as we go in a situation of higher disorder. Namely, if we have a more disordered situation, this situation is more probable than a less disordered situation. So, another criterion of spontaneously uh, <coughs> variation of a system is to go toward a situation of higher degree of disorder. Namely, the state function H, which is enthalpy, describe the energy of a system. The state function S, entropy, describe the disorder of a system. Okay? So, this criterion may be, uh, see, may be seen in this way, that going from reactants to products of reaction, we go from a situation of lower disorder denoted by S1 to a situation of higher disorder denoted by S2. Namely, this other criterion written in a formula says that the delta SR, namely the difference of entropy recorded in the reaction, namely the difference between the final state S2 and the initial state S1 must be higher than zero, okay? So, we have that. Wait for a moment. If in a chemical reaction, the energy of the system decreases, and the disorder of the system increase, we are sure that reaction occurs. If in a chemical reaction, the energy of the system increase, and the disorder of the system decrease, we are sure that reaction does not occur. But when? The energy of the system decrease, and the disorder of the system decrease, or when the energy of the system increase and the disorder of the system increase, we do not know if the reaction occurs or does not occur. 
Well, you have to merge, to, to put together these two different criteria to create only one criteria that works in whatever situation. And this goal is attained, is fulfilled by defining another thermodynamic function. This thermodynamic function is called the free Gibbs enthalpy, which is defined as, is a pointed with G, and G is equal to H minus T S, S is entropy, and T is the absolute temperature. Now, we did not define yet the absolute temperature, but in the forthcoming lesson, exactly the lesson which, in which we will study the property of gas, the behavior of gas, we will define which is absolute temperature. You know, uh, for a reaction to occur, it needs that the value delta GR, namely the variation of the free Gibbs enthalpy occurring in a chemical reaction, and this is equal to delta HR minus T that multiply delta HR, this number must be lower than zero. It does not matter if uh, delta HR is positive or negative, or delta HR is positive or negative. It is important that delta GR is negative. If delta GR is negative, if the combination of delta HR and delta HR is negative, it means that the reaction will occur. Okay? Then, chemical reactions are presented in this way by a sort of equation. Namely, we write that A, that the uh, A in capital letter, B in capital letter, C in capital letter, D in capital letter, are co chemical compound. A and B are the reagents. C and D are the products of reaction. A in lower letter, B in lower letter, C in lower letter, and D in lower letter are number, usually wall number, which allow the respect of the Lavoisier law, and uh, uh, are called stoichiometric coefficients. And uh, they allow to uh, the Lavoisier law to be respected. Chemical reactions are grouped in two large categories, the non-redox reaction and the redox reaction. Well, in the redox reaction we have that uh, one or more element varies their oxidation number. Let's see the non-redox reaction are the reaction in which no variation of the oxidation number of the various element is recorded during the reaction. So let's see, let's firstly see the non-redox reaction that are simpler. For example, we have acid bay reaction and let's have a look to this reaction. This is an example. ZnO, namely zinc oxide, reacts with hydrochloric acid to give a salt zinc chloride more water. Now, act as if this two is not written here. And let's see what does it do. You know, in a chemical reaction, you know that the Lavoisier law, namely the law of the conservation of the mass, is respected. So, every element must be present the same number of time, both 
on the left of the arrow, namely among the reactant, and in at the on the right of the arrow, namely among the products of reaction. So act as if here this is not written too. We have one atom of zinc, one atom of zinc, one atom of oxygen, one atom of oxygen. We have one atom of chlorine. Here we have two atoms of chlorine. For the Lavoisier law to be respected, we, have, we need to have two chlorine atoms also on the left of the arrow. So we have to put a numeric coefficient before hydrochloric acid, two. So in this way, we have two atoms of chlorine on the left and two atoms of chloride on the right. Then we have two atoms of hydrogen on the left, two atoms of hydrogen on the right. So the reaction is well balanced. Then we have the neutralization reaction among a base and H and a AOH, namely sodium hydroxide, which reacts with sulfuric acid. You have that the acid neutralizes the base with the formation of water and a salt is formed. So also in this case act as if there is, it is not written this two, there is not written this two. And let's try to think in a way that every atom appears the same number of times, both on the left and on the right of the arrow. We have one sodium atom here, we have two sodium atoms. So before NH and OH, a coefficient two must appear. So in this way we have two atoms of sodium, here we have two, atom of, two atoms of sodium. Then we have one atom of sulfur, one atom of sulfur. Then let's have a look to the hydrogen atom. We have two atom of hydrogen in sodium hydroxide, two in sulfuric acid, so four oxygen atom. We have only one, two hydrogen atom. So for four hydrogen atom to appear on the right of the arrow, a coefficient two must add that before water. And so the equation is balanced. If you see then there are two oxygen atom here, four oxygen atom here, four oxygen, so four and two, six. Four here, two here, six. So the equation is well balanced. Then let's have a look to precipitation reaction. As an example, if you mix a solution of sodium chloride and a solution of a, a silver nitrate, this is the first reaction I showed you during the first lesson when I presented you the Lavoisier law. We have that suddenly on mixing these two solutions, everything become white. And why everything become white? Everything become white because um, silver chloride precipitates, and this is why this is white. You know, this error and this arrow with the point which goes downward means that something is precipitating. And uh, if we try to balance this equation, we see one atom of sodium, one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine, one atom of chlorine, one atom of silver, one atom of silver, one atom of nitrogen, one atom of nitrogen, three atoms of oxygen, three atoms of oxygen. So this equation is already balanced. In this case, the coefficient that are before every reactant or product of reaction are in all case equal to one.
other example of reaction, if calcium oxide reacts with water, it turns into calcium hydroxide. If sulfur trioxide reacts with water, it turns into sulfuric acid. But also the in reverse reaction may be possible. If you heat calcium hydroxide, it decomposes into calcium oxide and water. And if you eat sulfuric acid, it turns into water and sulfur trioxide. Chemical reaction may be simplified by writing them in their higher form. Let's see what, what does it, it, it means. It means that, uh, for example, when we consider the reaction between sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid, we write it in this way. When we balance, we put a two here and a two here. But we must consider that sodium hydroxide, when it is in um, aqueous solution, it is EQ that is written here as, uh, as a PEDEX, is, uh, means the uh, physical state in which the reactant or product of reaction is found. Well, I was saying that sodium hydroxide, when is in a uh, aqueous solution is completely dissociated into sodium ion and hydroxide ion. So two of NOH decomposes, dissociates into two N plus one ion and two hydroxyl ion. Whereas also sulfuric acid is dissociated in aqueous solution in two hydrogen ion, hydroxonium ion, and one sulfate ion minus T. Also, sodium sulfate, which arises from the reaction, is completely dissociated in solution in N plus one ion and SO4 minus two. So, if written in the dissociated form this equation, we have that the 2 and a pu ion may be simplified with the 2 and a pu ion, and a plus ion, which is on this side. The same thing occurs for the sulfate ion. Then this 2 is simplified with this 2, this 2 with this 2, and it remains only H plus one plus hydroxyl ion H O H one minus one that reacts between each other to give a water molecule. So this is the same reaction written in the ionic form. As an example, look at this. If we write the reaction of precipitation of barium sulfate starting from barium chloride and sulfuric acid, this is the reaction written in the molecular form. Then we write it in the ionic form. So the barium chloride is dissociated into barium ion and chloride ion and uh, uh, sulfuric acid is dissociated in, in hydroxonium ion and a sulfuric uh, sulfate ion. Then barium sulfate is barium sulfate with precipitates and the arrow that go downward means that a precipitation of reaction is occurring. And then hydrochloric acid is dissociated in solution in H hydroxonium ion and in chloride ion. Chloride ion and chloride ion are eliminated. 
hydroxonium ion and hydroxonium ion are eliminated. So after the simplification, it remains only BH, BA plus 2 plus SO4 minus 1 that reacts among each other and gives rise to the precipitation of the sulf uh, barium sulfate. Well, as you saw, the balance of the non-redox reaction is usually very simple and you must only uh, be careful to give the right uh, stoichiometric coefficient for the Lavoisier law to be respected. But it is an easy operation that may be done simply, simply looking at the reaction. Well, now we have the redox reaction. And the redox reaction, in some case, the balance of the redox reaction may be a little bit more complicated. Well, the redox reaction will be presented in details in the exercise reaction. So, in the next lesson, you will see the exercise reaction. For, for now, <clears throat> I would like to focus your attention over another very important point. Look at this reaction. You have the aluminum hydroxide ALOH taken three times, which reacts with the hydrochloric acid to form in solution aluminum chloride and water. Let's first balance this reaction. So act as if these three here are not written. Look at this. You have one aluminum atom, one aluminum atom, so you need, you do not need anything here. You have here three chlorine atom, here you have only one chlorine atom. So for the reaction to be balanced, for the Lavoisier law to be respected, you need to put a coefficient 3 before hydrochloric acid. Then you have three hydrogen atom here and three hydrogen atom here. In total, six hydrogen atom. Here you have only two hydrogen atoms for the Lavoisier law to be respected, six hydrogen atom must appear also on the right of the arrow. So you must put a um, stoichiometric coefficient three, and we have three per two, six hydrogen atom, and the Lavoisier law is respected. Well, I would like to focus your attention on the fact that this reaction gives a qualitative indication saying that from a reaction of, by reacting aluminum hydroxide with hydrochloric acid, uh, aluminum chloride and water is formed. But it gives you also a quantitative indication. Namely, it is said that one mole of aluminum hydroxide reacts with three mole of hydrochloric acid to give one mole of aluminum chloride and three moles of water. So, if we know how many moles of aluminum hydroxide we react and we want to know how many moles of water are formed by reaction of this n mole of aluminum hydroxide. We see that the 
number of the mold that are formed are three times the number of mole of aluminum hydroxide. Namely, this relation helps. Namely, the number of moles of water that are formed are three times the number of aluminum hydroxide that reacts. It may be also said that the ratio between the number of the mole that are formed to the number of mole of aluminum hydroxide that reacted is the same ratio existing between their stoichiometric coefficient, namely 3 to 1. So we have the relation that the number of mole of water is the divided by the number of mole of aluminum hydroxide is equal to 3 divided by 1 which is the same previous reaction, okay? Now, let's see the next lesson. Next lesson is concerned about the behavior of gas. Well, the high reform state is characterized by the fact that gas uh, assumes the volume and the shape of the vessel that contain it. In gas, the various particles forming the gas are far from each other and disordered. And also gas are characterized by homogeneity of behavior, namely they show about the same behaviors as long as gas are far from the condition at which condensation occurs. In, practically, in practice in gas we have that the kinetic energy, the movement of the particles are able to win the force of interaction between the molecules of gas and so the molecules are free to are free to move well when a gas is contained in a vessel we have that the gas that is contained in the vessel uh, act a pressure over the inner wall of the vessel. We have to define what, what pressure is and the, the pressure was defined uh, without any doubt with the experiment performed in the 17th century by the Italian glory of uh, science Evangelista Torricelli. So now I'm going to describe the same experiment that has been done by Evangelista Torricelli something like 300 years ago. We take a vessel in which mercury is contained. I remind you that mercury is the only, is the only metal that at room temperature is liquid. And we have a, we say the barometric can, which is a cylindrical vessel that it is long one meter about or something more. And the diameter of this cylindric vessel is not important. Let's say that it is one centimeter. Well, this experiment might be done also with water or with whatever liquid, but there is a reason to perform this experiment with mercury, and we will see at the end of this uh, consideration. If we fill completely this uh, cylindrical can with mercury and we put a cork, on this vessel so as when we turn it upside down it does not empty completely. We 
turn it upside down. We'll put the extreme of this barometric can into the liquid mercury in this vessel and then we put away the cork. We will be quite surprised of the fact that uh, the barometric can does not become completely empty, but the level of the mercury decreases, 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 but then stops. And the height of the mercury with respect to the level of the free surface of the mercury is about 100, 760 millimeters. If the weather is good, this level is slightly higher. If the weather is not good, this level is slightly lower. Okay? Well, this barometric can does not tempt into this vessel because, because in the surface of the mercury that is in this vessel, that is below the barometric can, act the weight of the column of the mercury. But for this column of the mercury to not empty in this vessel, it means that the same weight, the same force that performed by this level of mercury must be acted also over the free surface of the mercury. And what is that perform this strength over the free level of the mercury? A strength that is equal to the level to the height of the mercury, 760 millimeter of mercury. Well, it will be the weight of the column of air that goes from the free from the free surface of the mercury up to the high atmosphere, higher to the high troposphere which occurs at about 10 kilometers, 11 kilometers from the crust of Earth. Okay? This is the reason why in the day of good weather this eighth of mercury is a bit higher and in the day of bad weather is a little bit lower because in the atmosphere, an amount of water vapor ranging between 1 and 5 percent is contained. When the weather is not good, this amount of water is higher. The water weighs 18, less than the air. The average weight of air is about slightly lower than 29. So when there is a lot of water, the air is lighter. And so to balance the height of a column, of lighter column of air, because there is a lot of water, it is sufficient a shorter column of mercury, namely something like 759 millimeter. 758 millimeter and something like this. Whereas, when the weather is very good, it means that there is very little water into the atmosphere. Namely, as water is lighter than air, the column of air which insists on this free surface of the mercury will be heavier. And being heavier, it will require a higher column of mercury, which counterbalances its weight. This is the reason why we see that when the weather is good, is high pressure. When the weather is not good, is low pressure. And another information which is quite a, quite a lot interesting is that 
if we perform the Torricelli experiment on the top of a high mountain, the level of mercury will not be 760 millimeter of mercury. It will be far lower because if we go on a very high mountain, tall for example 400 meters, the column of air which will insist on the free surface of mercury will not be tall 10,000 meters but only 6,000 meters, so it will be lighter, and being lighter, it will require a shorter level of mercury to counterbalance it. Well, what there is uh, of particular in gas is that all gas behave about in similar way if they are far from the, from the condition in which condensation occur. So we choose to refer to a, an ideal model which is able to approximate the behavior of the real gas. The, this, uh, uh, this uh, model is the model of the ideal gas. The feature of ideal gas are the following. The volume of their molecule is zero. The, uh, the absolute absence of interaction between among the particle of gas. Elastic collision, namely, collision in which no dispersion of energy occur. In every moment, the various molecules have different speed, but the kinetic energy of all the particles is constant and depends only on the temperature T. Let's see what does it mean. The volume of the molecule is zero. Obviously, it cannot be true because even though the molecule of a gas are quite small. They always save on volume. Sure. So we may say that, which is more realistic, that the volume of the gas, the volume of the molecule of the gas, can be neglected with respect to the total volume available from the gas. Okay. Then, this gas is composed by molecule. This molecule moves with a rectilinear uniform movement, motion, and this motion is disturbed only when the molecule of gas strikes into the wall of the vessel or strikes into another molecule. At this point, the molecules bounce against the wall of the vessel or against another molecule and the velocity, the speed of the molecule will change both as a, ve as a vector, namely in direction and versus, and both as the value. So, Absence of interaction means that this molecule must not exhibit any interaction among them. Also, this is not true because we saw that also completely apolar molecules such as atoms of helium, such as hydrogen molecule, may present as instantaneous dipole, which induce the presence of all the instantaneous dipole in the surrounding molecules, thus creating the van der Waal interaction. Okay. Then, elastic collision. Elastic collision means that when a molecule strikes into the wall 
of the vessel in which it is contained or the molecule of a gas strikes into another molecule, there is always a small dissipation of energy. This model considers that the dissipation of energy is zero. Okay. Finally, in every moment, the various molecules have different speed, but the kinetic energy of the particles is constant and depends only on the temperature. It means that these molecules are moves with different velocity. This distribution of velocity of the various particles of which a gas is composed is every instant changed because molecules strikes into other molecules or strikes into the wall of the vessel. The fact is that the kinetic energy of the system, namely the sum of the products, one half that multiplies the mass of the molecule times the square power of the velocity, all the sum of this kinetic energy are constant with time. And it is only a function of the absolute temperature of the gas. Okay? Now, let's see the law of ideal gas. Well, the law, the, the behavior of a gas is affected by these quantities. The pressure which is measured in atmosphere the temperature which is measured in degrees Celsius. In a few minutes we will see that it is measured in another kind of degree which is a little bit different but is very similar to degrees Celsius. The value of volume is reported in liters and the behavior of a gas, it depends on how much gas is contained in a vessel of volume V, namely the amount of gas which is defined as the number of mole of gas. Now, namely, we have four quantities that affect the behavior of a gas. So to understand in which way this uh, quantity affect the behavior of a gas, we keep two of these quantity constant and we let vary the other two. Firstly, we begin considering constant the temperature and the number of mole, and we let vary the pressure and the volume of the vessel. We see that if a gas is a kept in a vessel, which exhibit a, a volume PV1 at a pressure P1, if we halve the volume, the pressure become the double. If we reduce the volume to one third, the pressure will become three times. If we reduce the volume to one-fourth, the pressure will become four times, and so on. Then, if we expand the volume in which the, the gas is kept, and we double this volume, we see that the pressure will become half. It f the volume is in which the gas is initially kept is uh, become three times, we see that the pressure becomes one third. Namely, uh, all these evidences, all these experimental evidences may be condensed in the law that, that say that the products pressure per volume is a constant. 
Or we can also say that P1, V1, where P1 and V1 are pressure and volume of the system in a state one, is equal to the product P2, V2, where P2 is and V2 are volume and pressure of the gas at another, another, <clears throat> in another state. This is valid if temperature and number of mole are constant. If we want to report on a diagram this, this law, we have to report volume as a function of pressure. The fact that the product pressure volume is a constant is represented in a, uh, in a plane with an equilateral hyperbole. And so this, uh, this curve is asymptotic both to abscess and the ordinate axis. Varying the temperature, it results into different hyperboles. Okay? Finally, it can be said that if we report the volume of the system is a function of the reverse of pressure, this law say us that the relation is a linear relation and this is a straight line passing through the origin of the axis. Varying the temperature results in varying the, in varying the, uh, the, the slope of these straight lines. This is the Boyle law and was discovered in late 17th century. Let's see what occurs when we keep the number of mole and the pressure of the system constant and we let vary the volume of the gas with temperature. Well, this is the diagram in which we report that the volume of a gas is a function of its temperature expressed in degree Celsius. If V0 is the volume that a gas occupies, as ideal gas occupies at zero degree, we have that the volume of this gas varies linearly with temperature. Being more precise, the relation is this one. Look at this. V volume of the gas is equal to V0, which is the volume that the gas occupies at its at the temperature of the zero degree, which multiplies one plus alpha T. Alpha is the cubic dilatation coefficient of the gas and is equal to 1 divided by 273.15. On substituting in this formula, we obtain V is equal to V0, which multiplies 1 plus T divided by 273.15 making the same denominator, we have 273.5 plus T. If we put, if we say that T, T in capital letter is equal, and we call it absolute temperature, is equal to 273.5 degree plus 
the temperature expressed in Celsius degree, we can write that V is equal to V0. Here it remains only 273 degrees 0.5, which multiplies T. But 273.15 is the temperature in absolute temperature, which is measured in Kelvin degree, equal to the zero centigrade, uh, the, the, the zero degree in the, in, the, in the temperature. And so we can write this, that V divided T in capital letter is equal to V zero divided T zero. So we can say that the volume of a ideal gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature, okay? Some word more should be said regarding this absolute temperature. Look at this. If we keep on cooling the temperature of the gas, we have that the temperature, that the volume of the gas decreases in a linear way with increasing temperature. And uh, this volume will become zero at minus 273 degree 0.5. This value of the temperature is called the absolute zero. And this is a theoretic limit that cannot be overcome, but it cannot be actually even attained. You know why it occurs like this? Because look at this, you have that at the temperature of 273.5 degree minus namely at absolute zero, it is the value of temperature at which the volume of an ideal gas become perfectly equal to zero. We know that it is impossible in practice because even when the molecules are completely still and do not move at all, they will always occupy the volume of their molecule, okay? But it is possible only for ideal gas that we say that their molecules do not occupy no volume, okay? So we can say that the absolute zero is the volume at which the volume is the, the temperature at which the volume of ideal gas becomes zero. This value of temperature cannot be overcome. It cannot be either attained because to attain a low temperature, you need a, a source of heat which is at a lower temperature as lower temperature of temperature lower than absolute zero do not have physical sense, you will never have a source of heat at a temperature which is lower than absolute zero, so you cannot either attain the temperature of absolute zero. Then if
if you keep constant volume and number of mole and you let pressure and absolute temperature arrive, you obtain a law that is similar to the Schar law. The Schar law is the law which in which you make vary volume and temperature together. Namely, in the Charlot, you have that the volume is directly proportional to absolute temperature. And you have that also that pressure is directly proportional to temperature. Namely, the law of variation of pressure with temperature may be said that P divided T is equal to P0 divided T0. Okay. Then, considering the relationship between the volume and number of moles, the observation of uh, Gay-Lussac was very, very useful. Gay-Lussac noticed that the ratio of volumes of different gas that reacts between them or that form owing to a chemical reaction when measured at the same temperature and pressure are expressed by symbol wall number. Now, do you remember the first lesson in which we studied the definite proportion law the fact that in studying the definite proportion law and in making the ratio of the amount of an element which is bound the same amount of another element to form different compound gave a uh, ratio given by wall number was not a, a, a casual case. Also in this case, there is some reason. Before looking at the reason, let's make some example. For example, if we have one liter of hydrogen at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, this, this condition, zero degrees Celsius, namely 273.5 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere, are said temperature and pressure standard and is shortened, is said shortly, saying TPS namely temperature pressure standard. So if we have one liter of oxygen, TPS, reacts exactly with a liter of chlorine, TPS, thus giving rise to two liter of hydrochloric acid, TPS. Let's make some other example. Two liter of hydrogen, TPS, react with one liter of oxygen, TPS, thus giving rise to two liter of water vapor, TPS. Then another example, three liter of hydrogen at TPS react with one liter of nitrogen at TPS to give two liters of ammonia at TPS thus giving rise to two liters of ammonia. Well, first of all, the Gay-Lussac law allowed to understand that molecules of hydrogen, oxygen, um, um, nitrogen, chlorine, were biatomic. Actually, if they were monoatomic, one liter of hydrogen reacts with one liter of chlorine. If they were monoatomic, they would give rise to one liter of hydrogen chloride, whereas they give rise to two liters of hydrochloric acid. And this fact may be explained only considering that 
molecules of hydrogen and chloride are biatomic. Also, if two liters of hydrogen at TPS react with one liter of oxygen at TPS to give rise to two liters of water at TPS, this fact may be explained only considering that hydrogen and oxygen were biatomic, actually, if they were monoatomic. Two liters of hydrogen that reacts with one liter of oxygen would give rise to only one liter of water instead of two. Finally, again, we have with that when three liter of hydrogen at TPS react with one liter of nitrogen at TPS to give two liter of NH3 at TPS, this fact may be explained only considering that hydrogen and nitrogen are composed by biatomic molecules. If they were composed by monoatomic molecules, the reaction of three liters of hydrogen with one liter of nitrogen would give rise to only one liter of ammonia instead of The most important consequence of the Galeussac law was the Avogadro law, because Avogadro said that equal volumes of different gas at the same temperature and pressure contains the same number of molecules. Expressing the Avogadro law with a formula, we can write that the volume of a gas V is equal to the product between the number of moles of the gas and the volume of one mole. It must also be said that the volume of a mole of gas at TPS is found to be equal to 22.41 liters. Then the corollary of the Avogadro law is the Cannizzaro rule. The Cannizzaro rule says that Cannizzaro rule says that if equal volumes of different gas um, at uh, if equal volume of different gas at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules, the ratio of the mass of equal volumes of the two gas, their densities, is equal to the ratio of the molar mass. Look at this. B and 2 are two different gas. The ratio among between their density is dB divided by dA. But dB is the mass of B divided by the volume of gas. Ma and dA is the ratio between Ma, the mass of the gas A, divided by the volume of the gas. But we say that the volume of the gas is the same, so we and we is simplified. The mass of the B gas is equal to the product of the number of mole times the molecular weight of gas B, whereas the number of the mass of the gas A is equal to the product of the number of moles of gas A times the molecular weight of the gas A. But because of the principle, Avogadro principle, the number of the gas are equal, the number of moles of the gas are equal, so they are simplified and remain only the molecular mass of B divided by the molecular mass of the air. So the Cannizzaro rule is confirmed. Namely, the ratio between the gas of two different, of two, the ratio between the density of two, two different gas is equal to the ratio of their molecular weight.
Now, let us consider the various law of gas that up to now we have seen. The first one is PV equal P0 V0, which is the Boyle law, namely the Boyle who says that the product of pressure times volume is uh, a constant. Then we report the Charles law, namely the ratio between the volume of a gas and its absolute temperature is equal to the volume of the volume at zero degrees Celsius divided by the temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And then we report the law in which we let vary the pressure with the absolute temperature of a gas, namely P divided T is equal to P0 divided P0. Let us multiply member to member these three laws and we obtain P at 2 per V at 2 divided by T at 2 is equal to P0 at the second power, V0 at the second power divided by T0 at the second power. But by performing the square root of both member of this equation, we have that P multiplied V divided by T is equal to P0 multiplied by V0 divided by T0, but P0 is the pressure at TPF, namely one atmosphere. V0 is the mole of, uh, is the volume of a mole of gas, namely 22.41 liters. T0 is the temperature of zero degrees Celsius, namely 200 73 degrees point 15. If we perform this product, we obtained 0 0.082 liter atmosphere divided by Celsius degree. This constant is called R, R and is said to be the universal constant of ideal gas, namely the equation of state of ideal gas is PV divided by T equal R. But this law is valid for one mole of gas. If we refer to N mole of gas, we have to multiply the second member for N. And so this is the state equation of ideal gas, which says that PV is equal to the product NRT, okay? Then there are many other formulas that can be derived from this formula here. Let's have a look. Let's see. Instead of writing here N, we write M mass divided by M molecular weight, and we obtain this formula. Then we bring M at the first member and V at the second member. The M divided B is equal to D, density of the gas. So we have that the product MP is equal to DRT. So, let's have a look to the behavior of real gas. Well, the behavior of real gas does not differ very much from the behavior of ideal gas if we are far from the condition at which condensation of gas occur. But if we are close to the, con to the condition in which the condensation of gas occur, we have that uh, 
the difference of, uh, between the behavior of real gas and ideal gas is quite big. To keep into account, to take into account the difference of behavior between real gas and ideal gas, in the equation state of the, uh, of the ideal gas, we should add a quantity which keeps into account the value of the volume of the molecule. And this quantity should be subtracted by the volume of the gas. Then we should add another quantity to the pressure P to take into account the variation of pressure arising by the interaction that occurs between the various molecules. Obviously, these two amount are constant that varies for every gas. So the equation, the state equation of gas is an universal law which is valid for whatever gas. Whereas this is the van der Waals law is valid gas for every gas because for every gas has its couple of quantities that may be inserted in the van der Waal law. So R is the same for all the gas, but the amount that may be subtracted to keep into account the value of the volume of molecule and the value of the constant that keeps into account the variation of pressure arising from the interaction from the various volume varies for every gas. So the van der Waal law is not an universal law that is state equation law. Well, let's say something about the kinetic theory of gas. Gas are formed by molecules that are in uniform rectilinear motion. These molecules continuously vary the speed owing to the collision among them and with the collision of the wall of the vessel where they are contained. Using the law of the classic mechanics to, to a system formed by n gaseous molecules, the following expression may be obtained. The pressure P is equal to the Avogadro number divided by three times the volume of the vessel multiplied by the molecular weight of the gas and multiply the second power of the average speed of the various molecules. Then another formula which is very, very, very interesting in this is that the average molecular kinetic energy of the various molecules is equal to the product of um, one half multiplied by the molecular weight of the gas, multiplied by the average value of the velocity at the second square, at the square uh, power. Well, the second and this other, this other second law, it's by day turn equal to three uh, three half, which multiplies her, her constant, universal constant of ideal gas divided by the Avogadro number n, multiplied by the absolute temperature. This second law says that the kinetic energy of a system the average kinetic energy of a system of n molecules is a function only, linear function only of the absolute temperature of the system.
Well, <clears throat> for many problems of chemistry, it is necessary to know the distribution of the molecular speed. And uh, uh, it's not sufficient only to know the average speed of the various molecules. This problem was solved by Maxwell and Boltzmann, who gave the law of distribution of the molecular speed. Look at this, at the first curve, the, the curve reported in blue. In this diagram, we report on the abscissa axis the, velocity, the speed of the molecule, and of the ordinate axis, the ratio of molecules that exhibit the speed reported on the abscissa axis, namely N0 is the total molecule of molecules present in the system. We have that the number of molecules that exhibit the speed which has this value is this one. Namely, if we point this, uh, this value of velocity, we report the vertical line which meet this curve at this point, and uh, the ordinate of this point is this one. Namely, it means that for this velocity, there is this fraction. This curve is called the bell curve. And we have that this curve starts from the origin of the axis. Namely, it means that there is no molecule which has zero velocity. Then we attain a maximum. And then the number, the fraction of molecules exhibiting a particular velocity, a particular spin, is decreasing. And the curve is asymptotic to the abscess axis. This fact means that this fact means that for whatever value of the speed of the molecules, there will be always a, sh a small number of molecules which exhibit an speed which is there than these values. For example, let's take this value of speed. To this value of speed is related a particular value of the kinetic energy which is equal to the product of one half multiplied by the molecular weight multiplied by this value of energy. So if we want to see what is the fraction of molecule which exhibit a kinetic energy which is higher than the one of this, uh, of this particular value, it will be the area which is beneath the curve of Maxwell-Boltzmann. At the temperature T1, it will be the area which is reported in blue. If we go to a temperature T2, which is higher than the temperature T1, the curve will be similar in the shape, but it will exhibit a lower value of the maximum, and all the curve will be shifted toward right. <clears throat> and if we take a temperature T3, which is higher than T2, which is higher than T1, this curve will exhibit a still lower maximum and the old wall curve will be even more shifted toward right. And if we want to see what is the fraction of molecule which exhibit a kinetic energy which is higher than the one of a fixed amount, for example this one EC with asterisk, we see that at the temperature T1 is the area which is below the, 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 the curve, namely this small area in blue. 
at the temperature T2 is the area which is below the red curve, namely this area here in red. If we want to see what is the fraction of molecule which exhibit a temperature which is which exhibit a kinetic energy which is higher than the one of this fixed value EC is the area in green which is below the green curve. We see that going from temperature T1 to temperature T2 to temperature T3 this area increases very much. In practice we have that when the average kinetic energy of a system of n molecule grows linearly with the absolute temperature, Maxwell and Boltzmann discovered that the number of molecules, or we can say the fraction of molecules with energy higher than those of a fixed volume, grows exponentially according to this law the fraction n divided by n0, if n0 is the total number of molecules of gas present in the system, the fraction, the, the, the ratio between n and n0 represents the fraction of molecules which exhibit a kinetic energy, which exhibit a low, a higher value than this value fixed EC. We see that by increasing the temperature, this amount increases exponentially with the temperature. Namely, this is a very important fact because we will see that the vapor pressure of liquid increases exponentially with temperature. The speed of reaction increases exponentially of direction and this is a direct consequence of the fact that the fraction of molecules with um, kinetic energy higher than the one of a fixed value is increases exponentially with the temperature. Okay? Finally, to hand this To end this lesson, we have been talking up to now about pure gases, but low gases may be applied in the same way to gaseous mixture and to pure gases. When we have gaseous mixture, first of all, we have to define in some way the concentration of this mixture. Well, the, this, the concentration of this mixture is often denoted by the mole fraction Y. If we have a gaseous mixture, mixture of a gas A and a gas B, we have that the mole fraction of the compound A is given by the ratio between the number of mole of the compound A divided by the total number of the mole and present is the system. As the total mole present in the system is Na plus Nb, we have that the mole fraction of the mole fraction of the component A is the ratio between the mole of the component A and A divided by N A plus N B. And so the same thing occurs for the component B. Uh, uh, the, the mole fraction of the compound B, Y B, is equal to the ratio between the number of mole of the compound B divided by the total number of mole present in the system which is by, their, by its turn equal to the sum of Na mole plus Nb mole. Obviously, the sum of the 
small fraction of all the compounds that are present in the system will be obviously be equal to 1, as n divided n a plus n b plus n b divided n b plus n a, they give n a plus n b divided by, by n a plus n b equal to 1. Well, we, the only thing that we still have to say regarding the gaseous mixture is that the partial pressure of their component, PA and PB, may be defined as the pressure that every compound should exert if it alone occupied all the available volume. So, for gaseous mixture, the Dalton law holds the pressure exerted by a gas mixture is equal to the sum of the partial pressure exerted by the single components, namely the total pressure P tot, P -t -o -t, is equal to the sum of the partial pressure P A and P B of the two components of the, of the, of the, of the mixture. Moreover, the partial pressure of the single components are equal to the product of the total pressure multiplied by its mole fraction. As an example, PA is equal to P total multiplied by the mole fraction of AYA and PB is equal to P total multiplied by YB. Well, uh, the Dalton law may be demonstrated very, very easily. Look at this. Just a few minutes and the lesson will be over in three or four minutes. Well, the equation state of ideal gas holds both for the single component of the mixture than for the whole mixture. So we can write for component A that PA is equal to NA multiplied by RT divided by V. Whereas for the total, for, for, for the mixture, we have the P total is equal to N total multiplied RT divided by V. By dividing member to member these two expressions, we obtain it the first member, PA divided by P total. Here RT and RT are simplified, V and V are simplified, it remains NA divided by N total. But NA divided by N total is equal to the mole fraction of A. So we have that PA is equal to P total multiplied by its small fraction YA. As far as B is concerned, we have that PB is equal NB, which multiplies RT, divided by V. Divided by P total, we have P total is equal N total multiplied RT, divided by V. By dividing member to member this expression to this expression, we have PB divided P total is equal NBRT divided V, N total RT divided V. RRT, T, V, V are simplified, and there remain, here remain only NB divided by N total. But NB divided by N total is equal to the mole fraction of the component B, YB. So we have that PB, the partial pressure of the compound B, is equal to P total divided by YB. Finally, by summing member to member the two last relation, we have PA plus PB is equal to P total YA plus P total YB. 
putting in evidence p total, we have p total that multiplies ya plus yb. But ya plus yb is equal to what is known. So finally, we have that the p total is equal to the sum of pa plus pb, namely the total pressure of a mixture of gas is equal to the sum of their partial pressure. Well, that's all we will see in the next text on when we will be talking about the property of the solid state. See you.